So I started the book with theory, which isn't usually my strong set suit. I'm usually much more of a, a data person, but there's a traditional view of generational differences that says generations are different because they experience different major events like wars or economic recessions or pandemics at a certain time, and that shapes their worldview. Well, I agree that it has some impact, but events tend to have more short-term impacts. They don't really capture why it's so different to live now compared to living 200 years ago or 100 years ago or 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. What does is technology and not just the direct effects of technology, but also its downstream impacts. Things like individualism, more focus on the self and less on others, and a slower life. And I'm going to talk more about that later in the presentation. Basically, that because people live longer, that life expectancies have risen, the entire developmental trajectory has slowed down at every stage of the life cycle. And when I talk about technology, I always want to make it clear. I'm not, I don't just mean computers and social media and smartphones. I mean, all technology, including better medical care and air conditioning and faster transportation and washing machines, just all of these things that make our lives so different. And there, of course, there is a role for major events in generational differences, but it's much more secondary than in most previous theories. So let's talk about the slow life strategy. One example that people bring up a lot is with kids and teens that they don't walk to school by themselves anymore. It's much more common for their parents to drop them off. We have actual data on this. You get kids who live within a mile of school now much more likely to be brought by their parents while in the 1970s or 80s, they were much more likely to make their own way by usually either by walking or biking. So that's part of this bigger cultural story of the slow life strategy, that at times and places when people live longer, when healthcare is better, and when education takes longer to finish, parents tend to make the choice to have fewer children and nurture them more carefully. And that means the kids grow up more slowly. They have less independence at an early age. That's in contrast to the model, say mid 20th century, when instead people would have a lot of kids and just hope it worked out. That's how people used to do things. So that was my mother's family, eight kids on a dairy farm in Minnesota. So her brothers, my uncles would tell me these crazy stories like, oh, we went skinny dipping in the river and the neighborhood girls stole our clothes. They tell this story every single family reunion. So I finally thought to ask, well, how old were you when that happened? And one of my uncles said, I don't know, I think I was eight or nine. Wait, what? You know, where were your parents when this was happening? And that's my grandparents. Well, it was different then. It was 1948, and the idea was be home at dinner. You know, in a city, it would have been be home when the streetlights come on. Kids were much more independent at an earlier age then than they are now. I always want to note this, that slow versus fast is an adaptation to a particular place in time. It's not all bad or all good. So keep that in mind when you see some of the trends, because you'll see things that especially in public policy, you get excited, like, oh, that's good. That's a really good thing. Yeah, but there's also things that may have trade-offs that may not be quite as good. What we want to focus on is what does it mean for how quickly or slowly people are growing up? And this also does contradict something a lot of parents say. A lot of parents will say the opposite. I think kids are growing up faster because they have access to so much information online. There's some truth to that, but I also think there's a heavy dose of nostalgia there. There's the idea that, oh, but when I grew up, it's a much more innocent time. I think there are some reasons why this narrative has persisted, which are based in reality. Some are not, but there are some reasons why it is. It is true. When you look at those gains in median income, they're pretty much exclusively for those with a college degree. For those without a college degree, incomes are slightly down. And then when they've gone to college, a lot of times they have loans to pay off. So more expenses, even though they have more income. However, when the St. Louis Fed updated their look at millennial wealth last year, they did find that millennial wealth was neck and neck with Gen Xers at the same age. 
and pretty close to catching up to boomers as well. So even with college loans, so many more millennials went to college, they made higher incomes, it has taken that into account. The other piece is those income gains are almost exclusively for women. Now, that's a very good thing in a lot of ways to see women make so much progress when it comes to income. The downside is then if you, if a, say a heterosexual couple wants to keep up both of their relatively high incomes, then they have to pay for childcare. And especially these days, as I heard you discussing earlier, childcare is hard to find and can often be very expensive. There's also a psychological element, I think, to some of this, that there's also some disappointment with adulthood. Even if on average, people are in your generation are doing well, maybe you don't feel that way from upward social comparison, say on social media, or just from ex having expected quite a bit. And we know from that high school senior survey, expectations reached very high levels for millennials in terms of what they expected their education to be, what they expected their jobs and professions to be. Overall, there's a really pervasive pessimism out there, which I think is somewhat misaligned with reality. So there's this, I'm going to guess, millennial, trying to explain to my parents very gently that, tip, that basically nobody under 40 right now expects good things to happen ever again. And then Taylor Rents, who I know is a millennial, this is what I call the hellscape narrative. So she says, you know, everything is so bad because we're living in a late stage capitalist hellscape during an ongoing deadly pandemic with record wealth inequality, zero safe social safety net, job security as climate change cooks the world. Yes, we have problems. Absolutely. But does that really mean, as she says, you have to be delusional to live, look at life in our country right now and have any amount of hope or optimism? Basically, it's this very pessimistic look. And this was earlier this year, 2023. And my, my question is, okay, yes, we have problems, but right now, 2023, are things really worse than they were at the beginning of the pandemic? Are they really worse than during the Great Recession? Are they worse than 1993 at the height of the violent crime wave? Is it worse than 1968 when we had a ton of social unrest? Probably not, objectively speaking. So overall, incomes are doing pretty well. Older millennials actually time the housing market, again, pretty well. Now, up to 2020 is where we have that data of comparison at the same age. As you saw in that affordability chart, though, then we got the higher interest rates without prices coming down. So I think the millennials who did not buy into the market and Gen Z, they are in a tougher position now when it comes to housing. It's just the narrative was very negative even before that. Now there actually is something to worry about. But overall, in, in my view, there isn't a, a pervasive negativity, but which seems to be somewhat out of step.